Hi, folks. I know, uh, I know this is the last talk of the day, and I appreciate uh, you showing up, because um, I'm the only thing between you and the bar, I think. So, um, so real quickly, uh, contact information here. Reach out to me on Twitter or via email, and uh, feel free to rant. Um, so real quickly, to give you a little background, um, I am a member of the Apache Software Foundation, and, and I'm also serving, uh, among other places, on CloudStack's Project Management Committee. Um, but before I was doing anything with CloudStack, I was a recovering sysadmin and uh, worked in operations for about a decade. Um, at this point, that means that I, uh, I still have lots of scars, and I remember that it's down, not across. Um, I've, uh, but over the years, as I was working in ops, I was also contributing uh, in my time to some open source projects. So uh, I contributed pretty heavily to uh, the Fedora project um, and to Xenos and a few other projects. Um, I started working for cloud.com. Cloud.com got acquired by Citrix. And so I work in the open source business office and get to spend all of my time working on CloudStack now. So how many folks know what Apache CloudStack is? Wow, outstanding. Okay, so CloudStack is an open source infrastructure as a service platform, and essentially that means that it takes compute, network, uh, and storage resources and allows you to allocate them and allow end users to allocate them without necessarily giving away the keys to the kingdom. CloudStack's been around since about 2008 um, and uh, had some production deployments as early as 2009 and then uh, has kind of been in, uh, I don't want to say uh, stealth mode, but has been a little quiet since then. Uh, so uh, no big massive uh, marketing campaigns have gone out about it. Um, but it's been, uh, it's been around and uh, gotten some decent uh, adoption. So uh, it's gotten some adoption at some really large places. Uh, the largest deployment that I'm aware of is about 50,000 physical nodes acting as hypervisors in a single management plane. Um, and I think it's awesome. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that other options are not. Uh, you should, if you're doing due diligence, you're going to be checking out multiple of them anyway. So it's got a pretty web UI, and the web UI is beautiful. Nobody uses this to do real work, right? Unless you're a manager and you want to go look at pretty graphs. Um, or you need to show it to your manager to show off the pretty graphs. Uh, you don't use CloudStack in that, uh, in that manner, um, or at least not if you're doing real work. If you're doing real work, um, you're gonna be interacting with the API. And so that means that you're going to be using uh, either the EC2 API. Uh, we essentially have a translation layer that will take inbound EC2 commands, EC2 API commands, and we'll translate that to CloudStack's native API. Or you'll be using CloudStack's native API, or perhaps you use a abstraction layer that talks to that native API. So um, this really isn't about being a commercial for CloudStack. Uh, as much as I think that everyone should go use it, the more important thing that I want to talk about is really uh, this ability to define your infrastructure at a level, one more level abstracted uh, from what most people think of Puppet as doing. So infrastructure as a service removes a single constraint, right? So it's no longer waiting on IT to provision uh, compute resources. You don't have to wait on them for a VM or to, to rack a box uh, it anymore. You can go as a developer or an end user and provision your own compute resources. The thing that infrastructure as a service doesn't do for you, though, is, of course, it doesn't configure it. Well, that's, that's a, a really a solved problem now, right? So, um, whether you're going to use Salt or Ansible or Chef or Puppet, um, there are config management tools out there that you can use that will take care of that, right? Uh, so uh, infrastructure as a service without config management is really, uh, is really problematic uh, at any scale. So you know, when we're, we're talking about self-service, uh, I told you not many people use the UI. If you only spin up a single virtual machine at a time, maybe you don't mind having to click six or seven times to provision a VM. Um, anyone here doing things through Amazon's web console only? 
Uh, not, not many people do. They, uh, at a certain scale, it becomes impractical. A lot of people do use API tools, and a lot of people use some external tool. Um, they may have something that they write for their environment that says, hey, I need a virtual machine, provision me the right kind. Um, uh, or they may be using some command line tool like Bodo to do, uh, to do provisioning. The problem is, is that you essentially inject all of these ops people into, um, into the provisioning process. And because they're not ops people, uh, they don't know all about the environment. They don't realize, uh, they don't realize the idiosyncrasies that have been injected over time, and they don't care either. So all of those combined mean that that ends up being a, a pretty fragile environment uh, uh, that you, know, you can turn people loose, but what they actually end up with uh, can be problematic. And you really need a way to handle that configuration on a, on a wide scale. So there's a couple of strategies there, right? Uh, you can do baseline for everything. Uh, maybe you only care about SSH and NTP um, and some basic firewall rules. And so maybe you just do baseline for everything. So everything gets a default configuration uh, and that's it. Um, but so really when you're talking about this and doing something that requires more, you're really talking about a classification problem, right? So you spin up, perhaps dynamically, uh, perhaps on a user's whim, VMs, they may be one VM at a time, could be 500 VMs at a time. Uh, how do you decide what configurations to apply to all of those VMs? Just because you can spin up 1,000 VMs in 10 minutes doesn't mean that you can get them all configured uh, sanely and uh, getting them up fast and then not being able to control them or, or configure them is pointless. So um, this is, uh, you'll see lots of opinions of mine. Um, I think the wrong way to do it is dedicated images for each purpose. Um, there are some places, uh, the biggest one is Netflix, who do this. They've invested tons of time, tons of effort into those uh, tools that they're using to build their AMIs for uh, AWS. They spend uh, lots of developer resources building them, and uh, maybe it, it does work for them, clearly. I think for the vast majority of people, it's the wrong way to go about it. Uh, I think you're far better off using, uh, using config management really as a tool rather than trying to brute force uh, disk images to doing what you want. So we're really still talking about a classification problem, right? So how many people are still editing nodes or site.pp for every, for every node they add? Okay. This is actually the lowest number I've ever had in the crowd uh, saying that they do that. Generally, it's about half the crowd. We are at public comp, so I, I guess I should have expected, uh, expected a lower turnout of folks uh, doing this by hand. How many folks are globbing? Do you know what glob, how many people don't know what globbing is? Okay, so real quickly, um, you can use uh, no name or cert name, uh, and you can glob just like you would uh, from a command prompt. And so you say anything that begins with MySQL, I don't care what the rest of the node name is, uh, gets, uh, has a include statement for MySQL D. Uh, anything that has HTTPD uh, star uh, will get, uh, we'll get an Apache web server uh, include. And so this allows you to do name or cert-based um, distinctions. So if you can control the naming of these nodes, you can then say, if someone spins up MySQL 58, it's going to get uh, provisioned as MySQL. Uh, this is actually pretty powerful. It means that uh, if, you can, if you have uh, sane people who can name things properly, um, then you can actually uh, uh, do a lot here pretty, pretty easily. You can have five or 10 different definitions uh, for different types of nodes pretty easily. Uh, I think that works pretty well. Um, we talked about baseline. Some people are doing everything as a default. Uh, if you have single 
single purpose machines that can work. Um, you can also have you know, two or three types of machines and still find other ways to, to uh, define them and effectively have defaults. How many folks know what an uh, ENC or external node classifier is? How many don't know? Okay, so um, typically when you have site.pp uh, or nodes.pp, you, uh, you are telling Puppet in a text file about all of the nodes that you are managing. Uh, that doesn't scale very well because it then becomes dependent upon uh, stupid uh, humans to edit, uh, which is slow and manual, and we want to eliminate all of those humans uh, as much as possible. So we have an external source of truth, and that source of truth then provides us with information, and Puppet will query the external node classifier. Uh, so a lot of people, um, uh, a lot of people will use things like LDAP or or some other source of truth that essentially CloudStack can query and get information back, uh, and from that uh, make decisions uh, based upon what uh, what information's in the ENC. So you can also use facts. So um, anyone here not familiar with Factor? All right, so Factor obviously has this uh, set of uh, key value pairs that uh, provide information about the machine. And you can start doing um, essentially case statements. So uh, you might have a default class that includes our default uh, uh, default statement in um, site.pp that says include class base, and then when you get to base, you have essentially a decision tree that says if it's this type of, if this fact exists, go do something. Uh, if another fact exists, go do something else. So um, I cannot claim uh, that I originally came up with, uh, with this classification solution. Um, it's actually uh, Jason Hancock, and he's sitting four or five rows back. Um, he essentially came up with this solution that uh, during instance provisioning, you are telling your cloud management platform uh, some metadata about the machine. And uh, then you have uh, a custom fact, and Factor is querying that metadata and uh, has that metadata pushed back when it's contacting the, um, the puppet master. And then there's case statements that, uh, that make decisions based upon that fact. Okay, so let's look at some real quick metadata that we might inject. So we might define a role, a location, and an environment. And then we can make decisions based upon all of those. And so let's go real quickly. Uh, we'll say that role uh, that we're only looking at the role, and we'll have web server and uh, database as potential roles. And then we're making different decisions on that based upon that tree. Does this make sense to everyone? I'm not seeing any heads shaking no, so. Yes? Um, so I'm, uh, so first of all, we're doing a case statement uh, on a fact, and I don't have the fact named. So this is just a, uh, a statement declaring a, a fact, and it's, I don't have a real fact there to define. Um, however, this is only about half of what I really want to delve into. If you want uh, the custom fact that Jason wrote, uh, there's a link to that. There's also, um, he's got a great blog on how he did this uh, at one of the movie studios in Southern California. Um, I also only have about 45 minutes, and Jason's given an, an hour-long presentation on this, so you should go check out uh, his YouTube video. Uh, and these slides are on SlideShare, and uh, you can grab them there as well, so. Um, so, that's great for essentially taking care of our, um, of the instances that we have, right? So uh, let's get past the instance. 
and talk about where we want to go next. And so I had heard about things like this, you know, cloud formation, V apps, talk about uh, defining the, the machines themselves. And uh, some, of, uh, some of the folks at admins.com wanted to do something similar. They were using CloudStack uh, as their cloud management platform. And uh, they were using Chef. Uh, and so they used Knife. How many folks know what Knife is? OK, so not many folks know what Knife is. Knife, among other things, will provision virtual machines for you. Um, it's probably most analogous to uh, Vagrant or um, uh, maybe Puppet Cloud Provisioner. Um, and so they wrote a plugin for Knife so that it would talk to CloudStack. And uh, what they were really trying to do was to be able to define entire applications uh, that were multiple nodes, that required multiple different types of nodes in a single place. Uh, and of course, you know, being able to provision the one-off machines, right? So just to deploy a single machine is, is pretty simple, right? So, you call Knife and uh, you say create a server. No problem. But they had far more complex needs, right? And so I realize this is unreadable. We'll look at it in a minute. But this is essentially them defining for the entire company what a development Hadoop node or a development Hadoop cluster looked like. So that when their developers needed a Hadoop cluster, it wasn't uh, call up IT and let's uh, spin up a Hadoop cluster, it was the developers being able to easily do this. So let's, I think this is, uh, has some value. So let's look at the first section. It's really just the name uh, that you're going to be able to deploy with, uh, description of it, the version of it, because it's going to change over time, and the environment. Uh, and I said production here. It's not, not necessarily the case. But um, So the next section. Uh, is the first section where we're talking about servers. So there are three names, which means that there will be three servers defined, uh, defined here. And we've got a description of them, which is really human readable. Um, and we see template, which is the disk image. So uh, essentially the operating system that's going to be laid down uh, for the virtual machine. The service is... Um, it's just like a service offering in Amazon, so M1 small or M1 medium. Uh, you see port rules, which is the firewall configuration. So this is uh, firewall rules to open. And then the run list and actions. Um, hang on, what? The run list and actions here are essentially, uh, you're defining that this is a member of cluster A and that it is a Zookeeper server and that the actions uh, involved are uh, set up a Zookeeper server and, and install Chef Client. So that gets us that first set. I don't want to go through all of this, uh, but I just want to point out, so the next set of servers, or next server that's defined, is a Hadoop master. And you'll see that it's, uh, the only thing really different here is that we're defining networks. So, we're defining multiple networks that you can, uh, that the virtual machine's going to get when it comes up. It still has firewall rules. It still has a base image. The service has changed, but uh, really there's nothing else groundbreaking there. And then we have the, the final set of servers, um, another three Hadoop worker boxes. Um, and of course, we're getting firewall rules there as well. Uh, so again, nothing, nothing uh, terribly earth-shattering compared to the other three. So when we come back and look at this, they've essentially defined uh, in this chunk of code seven servers. Um, they have done the equivalent of include statements for these nodes, um, and uh, as well as defining how much CPU, how much RAM, what networks they're connected to, and firewall rules for the, uh, for the cloud platform to allow in to the machine. Um, so 
That means that a developer can do something like knife CS stack, create Hadoop cluster A, and they get seven machines up and running, and they don't have to know anything about how it was done. But I'm at PuppetConf, and so um, I'm also a Puppet guy. I've used Puppet at three different employers, and uh, every time I give this talk, uh, James Turnbull is turning red in the back, getting angry with me talking about Knife so much. Um, but uh, I really did want a Puppet equivalent of this because I think that this type of thing is incredibly enabling uh, and gets rid of a lot of crappy busy work. So I was jealous, uh, but I, I kept on going uh, because I didn't see anything immediately on the horizon that filled this need. Um, there were people working on Puppet Cloud Provisioner, but it, it wasn't quite uh, anywhere near, um, near this type of sophistication. So then I went to FOSDEM in 2012, and a cloud stack user who works for a really large, actually, I think I can say their name, TomTom, uh, Tom, uh, said, we're using cloud stack. We really like it. We're using it in multiple data centers across the globe. Um, but we saw this thing that this Puppet Labs employee went and wrote, um, and it works for Open Nebula, but essentially it's custom types and resources uh, for Open Nebula. They can essentially define a virtual machine in a Puppet manifest. And they wanted this kind of uh, awesomeness for CloudStack. And so it didn't click with me that this was exactly what I really wanted out of uh, my Puppet version of Knife CloudStack. So I'm like, so tell me why you want a, a custom type and resource? And they said, well, then we can start defining uh, applications and servers and, you know, exactly how much RAM should a uh, machine get. And um, we, we like configuring machines with Puppet, but we actually want to define the machine with Puppet. And uh, so they wanted to kind of escape machine configuration to entire environment and infrastructure configuration. So we're used to Puppet defining the configuration on the machine, right? So uh, if you use the old uh, package uh, file service um, design paradigm, that's what we're used to. We've got uh, far more sophisticated um, uh, design paradigms now with things like PuppetDB and Hira, and we can interrelate machines that we're configuring. What we really want, though, is we want to not just uh, define the configuration, we want to define the machine. We want to define collections of machines along with the networks, the firewalls, the load balancers, and everything else that's, uh, that really is that infrastructure. So last year at PuppetConf, um, Dan Bodie came up uh, and said, hey, you really want to come see my talk? I think you'll like it. And so I went and watched his talk and he had custom resources and types for Google Compute Engine. And I'm like, he did it for the wrong uh, cloud platform. Um, I mean, this is cool and it's impressive and it's something similar to what Ken Barber did for Open Nebula, but it's still not what I want. Uh, and you can look at his presentation there uh, that he gave. And I think there's at least audio, if not video of it. So I started harassing Dan. I harassed Dan's boss. I harassed Dan's coworkers. Um, I saw Dan at a lot of conferences. Uh, I tried to buy him copious amounts of alcohol. And in return, he wrote with Nan, puppet types and providers to make me shut up. Um, it was completely ineffective. I continued to harass him. Uh, he released this uh, a couple months after uh, Puppet Conf, and then for Christmas I finally um, annoyed him enough that he wrote CloudStack resources uh, and types. And so let's talk about how this works. So this is a Puppet definition of a CloudStack virtual machine. Um, so we've got a name, Foo1, we're saying that it's going to be present. Um, we've defined how much CPU and RAM, that's the uh, flavor. Uh, and we have zone, which is analogous to an availability zone, so where in the world are we putting it? 
We have that image, which is our disk image that we're putting down. Uh, and we're specifying at least one network in this case. So we can at least with Puppet now, we can define a, um, we can define a instance. We can also set defaults. So we have, uh, if our default is CentOS 6.3 or 6.4, we can say that that is our default disk image. Uh, we can say that our default machines have X amount of RAM, X amount of CPU, that they normally go to the San Jose um, data center. Uh, maybe we want to specify SSH keys by default for root uh, or specify a default network. Um, and that means that we can then get away with an instance definition that says, um, make sure that it's here and here's some metadata to toss in. So this is setting uh, metadata in the group field as opposed to uh, metadata that the, uh, that the virtual machine itself can see. But we'll look at some of the alternatives to that in a bit. That means that we can then define a class that has a couple of machines and then we can just include that class. So a simple include statement then defines this, uh, this database and Apache web server. Pretty simply. Anybody have questions here? All right, so real quickly, I'm gonna see if I can jump out. So, and you can't see that. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? So, um, if I want to do a really simple um, uh, single machine deployment, I can deploy my uh, really special Snowflake machine. And I'm merely saying it's here, what data center it's going into. Uh, the amount of resources given to it, the disk image, uh, and then some metadata about the machine. So, that is an old factor bug, and if I would update factor on my machine, it would go away. It has been fixed. I, uh, I harassed people at a number of puppet camps to get rid of that bug, and. Um, magically, it went away. So, 14 seconds or so, it, it went and provisioned the, the machine. So, you can also tear all of this down by saying, make sure it's gone. So, the only thing we're changing is ensure absent. Wow, I can't type. I shouldn't look at the screen. So let's try and do something a little more complicated. So uh, because I'm running this uh, directly with Puppet Apply, um, I'm, I've got an include statement that says actually include the class I've defined below because otherwise the class just sits there. Um, but I'm defining two machines, a web machine and a database machine. I've got some metadata about them, but otherwise they're really pretty standard. So actually, it didn't kill it the last time I ran it. Um, so those existed, and you'll notice it only took less than a second, which means that really all it changed was, uh, or it verified that those machines were up. So I've changed one thing in this manifest and all. So you'll notice I've changed a role from database to Postgres for the DB node. Um,
And you'll see that I changed that role and it did that pretty quickly as well. Um, one of the nice things, let's see if I can, maybe. So if you have pimply faced youth come along and decide that he's going to kill off of your web server, the next time Puppet runs, it will try and recreate it. And it'll take a second to destroy this because it's trying to do a clean ACPI shutdown. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is not actually doing a fact. This would be using CloudStack as an external node classifier. So you would have Puppet querying uh, CloudStack to tell you that metadata as opposed to using the fact. Um, and I really did it that way just to show yet another strategy for classifying in nodes. Um, you could also make part of your API call to set um, uh, to set that meta metadata, and so it would just be another field in your node definition in Puppet. And eventually it will go away. Eventually it will. Still stopping. All right, so now it's showing up as destroyed. So we'll switch back. So the next time Puppet runs, It should try and restart that node. We'll see if it does in just a minute. Typically, it takes about 15 seconds. So, um, yes. Um, so I have a um, there's a YAML file uh, that you specify your API key, your secret key and uh, the API endpoint that you're writing against. Um, I uh, so, let's see if, do I have that? No, so it must be, I'm doing it as a, Local user. So I have this transport.yaml file. Um, 
and I'll not have to go change my API and secret key. Um, but so I'm just setting the host port, um, whether it's using plain text or our SSL and the path to it. And so I understand, so this is the uh, types and providers for CloudStack are actually written on top of um, uh, Fog. And I understand the folks at Puppet are actually trying to make this a little more generic uh, because heretofore it's been CloudStack, GCE, and Open Nebula who've had something like this, and yet Fog uh, takes care of all of these. So there's some stuff coming that'll make this even more generic, but still allow you to define um, machines quite easily and, um, and define your entire infrastructure. Uh, some of the other things you can do, uh, you can specify, obviously, SSH keys. You can specify um, firewall rules, the networks that these machines are connected to. Uh, if you're using security groups instead of firewalls or, or uh, layer two uh, VLANs, you can, um, you can also manipulate those with uh, with CloudStack. Uh, some of the things that are being worked on are things like uh, dealing with uh, some of the more advanced services like load balancing. Uh, and so you can do a couple of things there. Any other questions that uh, I can answer for you? Yes? So uh, the question is how does this work in a master node? And essentially, it's not necessarily dependent upon the master, right? So um, it, you could define all of those definitions for, uh, for machines that are going to get deployed for any node that you manage. And as soon as it ran, it would, um, it would, um, As soon as it uh, ran, it would go out and it would be using Fog to communicate to CloudStack. And so um, I tend to do this on, um, on the master node, but I had, uh, I actually was using this. Jason was running hostedpuppetmaster.com for a while. And in the hosted Puppet Master, I couldn't install things like Fog. Um, I had no real control over the master. I could just push my configs to it. And so I w in that particular case, I would, um, uh, I would just pick one of the nodes that I was managing. I would push all the configs to it, and it would cycle through them uh, and make the connection to CloudStack. So it's not necessarily dependent upon the master. You do, yes. The transport YAML file has to exist on the machine that's going to communicate to, with Fog. Yes? Do you use this to, say, create 20 web servers and 10 DB servers? Sure. So, so you'd have a couple of ways of doing that, right? So um, overriding the name uh, when you set the class, uh, when you, say, include the class, just changing the name so that you could do that 10 times. Uh, you can make the definition to be deploy 10 of them rather than just a single node. Um, uh, I, so it's not released yet, but I believe there is a count variable uh, that's in some code that Dan originally wrote, but we haven't pushed out yet. Um, uh, if you look in my or Dan's GitHub account, uh, there's, a, there's a branch of this that I think has a count. So you can say spin up 10 uh, identical nodes when, you, uh, when you're deploying this. Um, and uh, that's essentially how you would, the nice way of getting around it if they're truly going to be identical and in the same application. If you need 10 distinct applications, you just want to use the class and have multiple instances of the class. What else can I answer for you? All right. Then allow me to declare that PuppetConf is over for you. Um, thanks very much. I appreciate you coming, showing up. And uh, again, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, I'm obviously here, but I am also on the interwebs. So feel free to 
say hi if you have questions. Thanks very much. All right, thank you very much, David. Uh, thanks for joining us at PubicConf 2013. Uh, my understanding is that you might want to check out the Diplomat Lounge uh, before you head out. But uh, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, there's also extra large and extra large t-shirts in, in the garden room. Yes, in the garden room. And maybe mugs and possibly bags also. Thanks.